So Sonia, you can start, it's fine. Okay, thank you. First of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me today. Um, it's a real pleasure to give this presentation. And I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. I would have loved to join the discussions there. Um, okay, so this work that I present today is in part based on joint work with Alexandre Balta. So let me get to the overview of what I want to do. So I'll tell you a bit about dynamic modalities. And my background is logic. So I come from model logic. I'll tell you everything about dynamic modalities. I'll look at the relational semantics and at actions that change models. Then I'll give you the general idea of a dynamic semantics for conditionals. And then I look at a bunch of examples of dynamic conditionals, including counterfactuals. Um, and then later we get in point four to an interpretation of quantum conditionals. And I look at them as dynamic conditionals, but also as counterfactual conditionals. So I will relate them. And then at the end, we get to conclusions and open questions. And I'm not going to deal today with entangled systems. So there are many open questions that are still, um, that are still for the end. Okay, so dynamic modalities. Um, so one can naturally associate with any action or an event alpha. Think about any physical action or action that you could do. A propositional operator, which I will write as box alpha. And I call this a dynamic modality. So for every property or proposition phi, this dynamic modality as an operator gives me a new proposition. And that proposition is denoted as box alpha phi. And the reading of it is just saying that after the action alpha, phi holds. Now, in computer science, this construct is known as the weakest precondition, ensuring that phi is satisfied after an action alpha. Um, as you saw on that slide, I'm actually uh, looking at properties and propositions in the same way. This means that I look at properties of any given system. So this can be, you can think of a multi-agent communication system in AI, or you can think of a quantum system. And I treat the properties of systems as propositions in a logical language. Now that idea of building a logical calculus for physical properties that goes back already to 1932 um, in von Neumann's work, which you see here in his book, Mathematical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. Because what he says there is that apart from physical quantities, such as position momentum, there exists another category of concepts that are important objects of physics, namely the properties of the states of physics. And so when I say a property or proposition, what I mean is, for instance, the property that a physical quantity takes a specific value or that a particle is located in a state space region with specific coordinates. Now, what von Neumann did was he argues that the relation between the properties, um, that there is a relation between these properties and the projection operators that are definable on the Hilbert space. And that allows you to get some kind of logical cal uh, calculus. We'll come back to that later on. So indeed, I will see in the case of physics, quantum physics, I will see these properties as physical properties related to projection operators or equivalently to the closed linear subspaces of Hilbert space. But first, let me get back to my dynamic modalities. So I started the slides with um, box alpha, my dynamic model operator. And there are two ways, or I'll give you two ways to think about these dynamic modalities. And that's related to the ways in which you think about the actions alpha. So there is a local view of actions and there is a global view or global interpretation of actions. So in the local view, here we view alpha as a real action that might actually happen in the current state of the world. So this proposition after alpha phi here is a proposition about the possible futures of the real world if event alpha happens in the, the current world or in the current state of my system, then after that phi will necessarily come to be true. So that's one reading of this model operator that I have. Another reading would be to say that, well, alpha 
this action is a transformation or a modification of the entire model that represents the possible worlds or the possible states in which my system can be in. That would include even mental actions that happen in the mind of a subject as well as physical and metaphysical actions. So these are two different views of how you can see an action happen, either as a, a local thing uh, in a given world or as a transformation of an entire model. When I use the word model or state, I use them interchangeably. So for me, the, the notion of world comes from the notion of possible worlds as used in philosophy and model logic. And they, I can also see them as points in the model or states of the system. Now let's get to the relational semantics. So these dynamic modalities, box alpha phi, as I I've introduced them, they form the basis of propositional dynamic logic, where the actions alpha are modeled as binary relations on uh, between the possible worlds or states of my model N. So if two worlds S and T are such that they are related from uh, by, I can go from S by action alpha to t, then this means that this event alpha may happen in the world S and it may change the world into a new state t. So formally, we have a semantics for this modality now. So this is my modality, const, uh, my dynamic modality, box of phi. And I use the logic notation. This, so this first part just means that um, after alpha phi is true in a state S of my model N, if and only if phi is true in a state T for every state T that are related to S by my action alpha. All right, now you can give a generalized semantics using the idea of model transformers, which goes one step beyond the semantics that I've just presented. So, the global interpretation of actions leads to this generalization because intuitively the worlds of my model N, they represent real possibilities. So this can be future, past, epistemic possibilities, but an action does not necessarily, an action in a model does not necessarily result in any actualization of the real possibilities that were already in the model. So it might mean that I have to transfer the model or update the model to a new one. So in the generalized semantics, the action alpha will be interpreted as binary relations uh, between different models, namely between the worlds in the given model M and the worlds in a different updated model, which I will write as M with a superscript alpha. So this means that the semantics in that, so the generalized semantics can be written as follows. So after alpha phi is true in a state of my model, if phi is true in the updated model and superscript alpha in the same state as. I write it like this, but that might be depending on which modality we're looking at, or which conditional we're looking at, there might be certain preconditions that you need to require to make sure that the action alpha can actually happen in the model M. Now, so um, the modalities that I've written down, they are box modalities. So I've written them between the square brackets alpha and they're known to be universal modalities. This means they quantify uh, universally over all the possible states uh, or worlds that may result by doing an action in a given state. There is a dual to this and you can define an existential modality as the dual of the box modality by using the negation. And so then uh, using these type of brackets, you write down the existential modality. And you see indeed that this, the interpretation or the semantics for the existential modality uses an existential quantifier. So after alpha phi here, using the existential version, it means that phi is true in T for some T that is related to S by alpha. All right, now there are many more things and actions that you can consider. So it would be useful sometimes to use, to consider also the converse modality. So then we would take uh, the action that corresponds to this would be the converse of the relation 
for the relation of alpha. And we write it here using minus one in a, in a superscript as the modality, which would say that alpha happened and phi was true before alpha happened, so before that. In computer science, these constructs are known as strongest post conditions. The interesting thing in propositional dynamic logic, if I take these things as basic constructs of propositional dynamic logic, is that one can consider natural regular operations on actions. So I can combine different actions in different ways. I can take the non-deterministic choice of actions, first do alpha, then do beta. I can do uh, the sequential composition of actions, first do one. No, so the first one was do alpha or do beta. And the second one is sequential composition, first do alpha and then do beta. Or I can iterate uh, an action and uh, the way to write it is using the Kleene star. So here we repeat the action alpha some finite number of times. And these constructs have um, simple relational definitions. Uh, to, so for this one, you just take the union of the relations so for the relation of alpha and the relation of beta. Indeed, so these actions uh, allow us to combine. So this, uh, this way you can combine these actions in PDL, propositional dynamic logic. PDL comes also with one specific construct, which is very interesting for us, especially if I later move on to the quantum case. So propositional dynamic logic cons contains a type of action alpha, um, which is seen as the abstract test of a formula phi. So I write this action alpha as question mark phi. And what it means, the standard semantics of it would say that this action can happen in a world S only if S satisfies phi. So it's really a test for phi. In this case, the action doesn't do anything to the world. So it leaves the world S to stay completely unchanged. So this is a static action, it checks, um, it tests whether or not phi is true. And the semantics for this action, now question mark phi, so for the test of phi, would here just be the pair, these pairs were uh, of states S where phi is true. So this consists of loops where we know that phi is true. So it's a test action for checking whether phi is true. That's interesting because it allows us um, to use together with the other constructs that I have defined in operations, you can define complex programs as propositional dynamic logic terms. So for instance, the standard do until operation as a program is a specific action, but it's a complex one, which is a combination of specific terms from PDL using this test. So you test for not phi, then you do alpha and you keep repeating this until you, you, you reach your condition phi. So until phi is actually true. All right, so now let's get to the dynamic semantics. So use this propositional dynamic logic to give you a dynamic semantics for a whole bunch of conditionals. So the general idea is this, you take some type of conditionals, phi implies psi, and I'm going to associate with the antecedent phi, the conditionalization action alpha phi, which is modeled as a, a well-defined binary relation or a model transformer, R, and then my subscript here is alpha phi. And it has this natural intuitive dynamic interpretation because what I want is that this implication phi implies psi is true in my state as of my model M, if my dynamic modality for the action alpha that depends on the antecedent phi holds. So psi is true after alpha phi. That gives me a dynamic direct interpretation of the conditional. And of course, then the, the important thing is, is to specify in detail what this construct is. So is it a model transformer? Is it a binary relation between the states of the models? And what conditions hold for this? And there are many intuitive interpretations uh, for this action alpha phi in my construct that I've written out. So it can be read as maybe I'm testing whether phi is true, like question mark phi, the PDL test that I had before. 
or maybe they should encode something like learning that phi is true. Or in belief revision theory, I can think about it as revising my beliefs with phi. Or I can do hypothetically accepting that phi is the case. Or when you get to, and we will come to this, the physics side here, I would do a yes no measurement of a property phi on a physical system with a successful outcome. Or, and then we get to the counterfactual interpretation, I can perform a, on the current representation of the world a minimal change, a mini surgery or an intervention that realizes phi. So these different ways of reading it uh, will be different, correspond to different conditionals, but all seen as dynamic conditionals in this form. Of course, they all will depend, have um, uh, different conditions or extra um, operators that may need to be added to it. So, because in some cases, the general idea can straightforwardly be applied. Uh, in other cases, quantum conditionals, the, the application here will involve some work, but still it will fall under this general program of seeing all these conditionals as some form of dynamic conditions. And uh, most of the conditionals uh, with the standard relational semantics, they cannot be seen as simple dynamic modalities for some meaningful action. So the question is, what is then the meaning of alpha? What is the action specifically that we're looking at? And indeed, so in many cases, as we will also see, the, um, we might need to add dynamic modalities to it, the, PD, the regular PDL operations or uh, epistemic or dochastic modalities to capture the, the desired meaning of these conditions. So, but I want to look at specific examples so the, the first example here of this dynamic conditional would be the material implication. So let's see how to capture the material implication. Well, the material implication, and actually this is known in the literature on propositional dynamic logic, um, would actually be equivalent to this. So after a test for phi, and now I'm using as alpha the test, the successful test for phi that doesn't change the state. So after a successful test for phi, then phi holds. So this is my dynamic modality. And you can prove that that is indeed the case, that if this is true, then the standard material implication from classical logic holds. So that gives us a direct dynamic rendering of the material implication as a dynamic modality uh, for the static act. So the action here is a static action of doing a test for a formula phi. Right, so that's very interesting. Um, another way, um, another place or part of the literature where these type of modalities are used, the dynamic modalities are used, is to model the act of learning. And this also relates to formal learning theory, but I'll not get into that part. So let's look at how to model this. So in the literature, this is done in the type of logics which are called dynamic epistemic logics. Um, so they look at sentences of this form, so bang phi psi. So bang phi here, explanation mark phi, is a specific action alpha. And how do they read it? They say, after phi is learned, psi holds. Now this act of learning comes in this case, because it's a real knowledge update, so the the agent really learns something, learns that phi is the case. So this means this new information phi is a hard fact and it comes with a warranty of truthfulness. So it is absolutely certain and truthful uh, new information that the agent learns in this case. So in dynamic epistemic logic in the literature, this is called the truthful public announcement of phi. And in certain multi-agent context, um, it is the action by which all agents uh, learn jointly, publicly, and simultaneously that phi is the case. Um, so in this, in this setting, if I restrict to only a single agent who learns phi, then indeed this means learning with new hard information that phi is true, and after that psi holds. How do they model this? Well, in the models in that case, 
um, they have to capture the, the knowledge of an agent. So suppose we model the agent's knowledge about the real world as a set of epistemic possibilities. So this consists of a set of possible worlds that the agent considers possible. Now, the action bang phi, which is my action alpha here, corresponds in that case to the agent has a whole bunch of epistemic possibilities, some where phi is true and some where phi is not true. Now he learns phi and what it does to the model is that it eliminates all the not phi worlds from M, from my original model. So this action is an example of a model transformer. It transforms the model that has possible not phi worlds into a model where these not phi worlds are deleted. For prob probabilistic models, um, in which the possible worlds are assigned subjective probabilities, this action directly corresponds to Bayesian conditionalization. Because in that case, uh, after eliminating the not phi worlds, you have to renormalize uh, the probabilities over the remaining set of worlds. And in model theory, this action of bank phi corresponds to what is known in model theory as relativization of a model to a sentence phi. So the model is transformed by eliminating some of the not phi worlds and restricting all the, re the relations that you might have over these possible worlds to the remaining worlds. Okay, so that's in a nutshell how they model um, learning acts of agents in multi-agent systems for dyna using dynamic epistemic logic. Now, another example, I go briefly over these examples without giving you a lot of details in it. So we will get to a bit more details when we get to quantum, but we can come back if there are questions about this because I know this was very fast. So in case we are modeling not knowledge updates, but the belief changes of agents. So in this case, they also consider a dynamic modality, which is here written on the bottom of the slide. So after action alpha psi holds, where action alpha now is up arrow phi. And up arrow phi means we do a lexicographic upgrade with a sentence phi. What does this lexicographic upgrade as an action do? Well, it in, you introduces to the agent phi as soft information, which is not necessarily true. So this is not necessary. There's no warranty of truthfulness here. So the agent only comes to believe that phi is the case without necessarily knowing it for sure. So he might still regard not phi as a possibility, but he should believe phi. So these type of models have a plausibility ordering over them. And what the action of RFI does is it changes this plausibility order in such a way that the phi worlds will become more plausible than the not phi worlds. Right, so that's one way in which uh, belief revision theory uh, has used this idea. And in dynamic epistemic logic, you can make that belief revision operator um, explicit using the dynamic conditionals. Now let's get to another example of dynamic conditionals, and this would be the counterfactuals. So take the semant So I'm taking the semantics of counterfactuals in terms of Rob Stalnaker selection functions as generalized by David Lewis. So I'll first look at, at their set. And what they say here is that for each proposition phi and each possible world S, we are, uh, we are given a set of possible worlds satisfying phi. And this is written as the selection function depending on phi and S. So the worlds in that set, so the worlds T in this set, they can be thought of as the most similar worlds to S that satisfy phi. So the Lewis, of course, the selection function will have to satisfy a number of conditions. Can't go uh, into all this, but the, the Lewis counterfactual, um, if it had been the case that phi, then it would have been the case that psi, and this typically is written in this way, is defined to hold if psi holds in the most similar worlds that satisfy phi. So using my uh, semantic notation, the, the notation for the semantics, and you see this counterfactual is true in a state S in my model. If psi is true in all states C, 
that are related via the selection function to S in this way. So that's the standard way in which um, Dalnaker and Lewis have introduced this notion of um, counterfactuals and their semantics. Now, the Lewis semantics can be dynamically repackaged in a trivial way by associating to each selection function f in a world s, the conditionalization action alpha that should depend on the antecedent phi. So I can define this relation s to t, uh, depending for alpha phi, when the selection function holds. So, in that way, you obviously have that you can rewrite the semantics for the counterfactuals as a dynamic conditional, as the same dynamic conditional format that we saw before. The only problem here is how can you now in give an interpretation in a natural operational way of what this action should be? What is this action alpha that depends on the antecedent when I give this interpretation of counterfactuals? Now, you cannot interpret it in general as a realistic action that can actually happen in the real world, because that's not in line with what counterfactuals stand for. So typically, these actions are real counterfactuals. So performing it would correspond to what Lewis has called a small miracle, seen as a real action, a violation of the laws of nature. But if I take my second reading, of what an action is, so the global reading that I introduced from the beginning, then now I can reinterpret alpha phi as an action that can happen to the model, so as a model transformer and not necessarily as an action in a model. So the natural way to do this is to minimally transform having any given world by a series of small interventions in order to to meet the requirement phi in order to, to get to the closest possible world of phase. So these model transformers, they can comprise all kinds of actions. So that can be actions from the past, the present, the futures. It can even be Lewis's abstract uh, small miracles. So at a conceptual level, this global interpretation of actions, or I look at them as model transformers, that bears a direct similarity in the case of counterfactuals to the subtle account of counterfactuals that Pearl has, uh, that refers to Pearl's work, where he uses the terms of mini circuit interventions as representing small changes into a causal model. Now, another example that is of course related to this are the causal intervention conditionals. So first we looked at counterfactuals a la Lewis and Spellmaker, and now I look at the, the causal intervention conditionals. So I refer here to the work of Joe Halperin, and that's his book on actual causality, as well as other logicians who have formalized the interventionist accounts to causality. So they have a logical set saying where they have formulas of this form, and actually, it is written already using the dynamic modality notation that I have from the beginning. This notation is used in Halperin's book, although they don't refer directly to it as a dynamic modality, but that's actually what's going on. So the reading of this is, after intervening, uh, we're setting the variables in the set y to the values uh, in small y, and then this formula psi should hold. And what is the semantics of it? The semantics says that given a model M and a given context where we determine the exogenous variables, uh, then the updated model, which would be written as this with a subscript, the updated model would then be the transformed model that results from doing an intervention and resetting the values so that in the way that they should be. So then this conditional holds if and only if psi holds in the updated model. Of course, in this way, so you see that this fits with my general uh, semantics as a dynamic conditional. So the interventions here come from outside the system. So we know that they disrupt the system. And of course, there's much more to say about it. Uh, Halperin together with Perl, they provide specific conditions that need to hold when we're talking about actual causality. 
and there are conditions that need to be ensured in order to, to make sure that the interventions perform a minimal action or a minimal tendency. Now let's get to quantum conditionals. Um, oh, Sonia, yeah? just, to, just to tell you, there is more or less 10 minutes left. I guess it's yeah. fine. But... Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. OK, so this is uh, more or less the last part of the presentation indeed. So I get to the quantum part. So here I look at uh, quantum logic. And as usually represented, it's a non-classical logic with the same syntax as standard propositional logic, but with different laws. And specifically, disruptivity is one of the laws that needs to be weakened or that fails. And this logic goes back to Birkhoff and Neumann in 1936 and to the work of Neumann in 1932. There's a lot of work after that on these type of logics. Now, I'll give you my notation for, I will use a notation for a quantum negation. And for that, I use SIMFI, and I call it also the orthocomplement. I have a notation for the disjunction, quantum disjunction for which I have this square disjunction. And I have a notation for a quantum implication, which is written with the superscript S. Um, tell you what that means. So the disjunction actually is definable using the De Morgan laws, which hold in quantum logic using the negation and the conjunction. So that's not very special. Um, now the quantum conditional. And so this S as a superscript in the conditional comes from the S from Sasaki hook. The Sasaki hook as a conditional is definable using the quantum negation, the quantum disjunction, and the conjunction. And this implication here, so the Sasaki hook satisfies modus ponens, and it behaves in a certain way, but it does not satisfy the deduction theorem. And it has been a long-standing problem to give a realistic operational interpretation to this. Now, before I get to further discussion, let me tell you what my semantics is for these sentences in quantum logic that I'm using. So I assume a state of a physical system to be represented by a non-zero vector in the Hilbert space, and the, the possible physical properties of the system correspond to the closed linear subspaces of that Hilbert space. Say that a state satisfies a property if it belongs to that subspace, the sentences in quantum logic are interpreted as linear subspaces. The orthocomplement is the, so the sim phi is the orthogonal subspace to phi. The conjunction will be interpreted as the intersection of subspaces. And the disjunction would be represented as the, the subspace generated by the union of the two. All right, now why does this deduction theorem fail for this? quantum implication, because here I have a statement of the deduction term, uh, because we know from logic that any binary connective, so any implication here that satisfies this theorem, and this is actually the implicative rule together with modus ponens, is necessarily distributive. So this introduces distributivity, and that is a problem in quantum logic, so that means the deduction theorem cannot hold. Now, where are we left with? Because in implication, you typically want to satisfy this law of entailment. So phi should imply psi if psi follows from phi. And now, if we want this to hold, then the question is what type of implication in the quantum case can we get? Well, there are actually five possible definitions of binary implications state defined in terms of quantum conjunctions and disjunctions that satisfy this law. Now the Sasaki hook is the one that I introduced and it's the best behaved one because it is locally Boolean. So if I take a sub logic, um, a classical sub logic, then I see that that Sasaki hook will behave as a material implication on the classical parts. So it's actually a nice behaved uh, the nicest behaved quantum implication that we can define. Now, um, what is this? How should we read or interpret this? So, the quantum conditional has been seen as a Stalnacker counterfactual by Hardegree. Gary Hardegree actually saw that it satisfies all the properties of the Stalnacker counterfactual. And of course, the possible worlds here are the states of the system, so the vectors in my Hilbert space. 
But then the question is, well, it's fine. We can interpret the Sasaki hook in this way, namely saying that Psi is true in the most similar state of the world to the real one that satisfies Phi. But what does quantum logic have to do with counterfactual reasoning? Well, actually, what are the selection functions? So I introduced the selection functions for counterfactuals. So here, the selection functions are the role of the selection functions is played by the projectors on the Hilbert space. So for each subspace on the Hilbert space, there is a unique projector onto that subspace, which maps every vector V to the vector of the application for that projector onto V. And so you can uh, write the semantics now in this way. I can say that the quantum application holds in this state if psi holds onto after applying this projector here on psi, on phi. This shows indeed that the projector is a Stalnacker uh, selection function for quantum conditionals when they're seen as Stalnacker lower conditionals. But then the question should come like, but we are not interpreting the projectors of quantum theory in terms of counterfactuals. They are not similarity relations or small miracles. They are used to represent measurements. Moreover, uh, they're part of yes-no measurements. So yes-no measurement or a binary measurement of a property phi corresponds to a pair of projectors, one onto the subspace phi and one onto the subspace not phi. Now, if I link those type of measurements to quantum theory, then there's a lot to say about it because my view, they're related to ideal measurements of the first kind as they were introduced by Wolfgang Pauli. We, will come, we could come back to that later. So what I did in my work was that we viewed these projectors now as quantum tests for phi. So I used the PDL notion of a test for phi, but now the quantum version of it. And it would correspond to the action of performing a measurement that successfully tests the property phi. So I denoted as question mark phi, but now with a subscript Q for quantum test of phi. What it allows me to do is actually to say that these projectors structure the Hilbert space as a dynamic critical model, as a label transition system with the non-zero vectors as possible worlds and this quantum test as actions given by projectors. So this means that a Sasaki hook can be rewritten as a dynamic conditional for a quantum test. So for projective measurements where I do a successful test. So the yes part of a yes no measurement. And after that, psi that the consequence should be to the hold. So in other words, this Sasaki hook implication says that if property phi is established by a successful quantum measurement, then property psi holds after that. Now, I am viewing these quantum tests as interventions. They are deterministic because measurements are not their measurements themselves. Yes, no measurements are indeterministic, but the quantum tests, the yes part of this is a deterministic action. Um, and you always have this indeed that after performing this action, after doing a quantum test for five, five holes. So these are actions of the type alpha phi that we've seen. Of course, they are not the miracles of Lewis, but these are real possible in the physical world. So I view them as these quantum tests as interventions all up for. They do disrupt the internal ongoing causal dynamics of the quantum system and the, the internal causal dynamics. I would capture that using unitary evolutions and the interventions using these quantum tests. Of course, the quantum tests also come with uh, can be seen as a learning action because an observer learns information after doing that that test. But what they learn is something about what is true after performing the test, and not about what was true before performing the test. Now, here is a table, and we can come back to this if there are questions. Where I just compare all these uh, different operators that we have seen. So this is my dynamic conditional. And alpha phi can be interpreted as a test, the PDL test for phi, as a public announcement for phi, as a belief revision with phi, as a quantum test, or as a, a Lewis type of counterfactual action. And then you can really compare what is going on at, at every different level with these different uh, conditionals. 
Now, let me get to the conclusion. And I hope there's maybe still some time for a question. Uh, so I use logic to compare ontic and epistemic informational aspects of various conditionals. And I am really aiming for a unified setting where it can capture both classical and quantum conditionals. Um, the local and global view of actions that I have presented here, they are of course related. Translations can be provided in different accounts. And Pearl also in his book has, um, has related back to Lewis's account on counterfactuals. Um, viewing these quantum tests as type of interventions on single systems does require us to have a better theory of quantum measurements and observations. Um, I didn't hear Sol for say anything about the measurement problem, but that should be on the top of the agenda, I think. The PDL logic that I've hinted at here and presented in part um, can be extended to reason about entanglement and multipartite systems, but that does not provide us with a causal explanation for non-local correlations that you see in entangled quantum. So there is still a lot to be done there because even though you can find analogies between uh, standard counterfactuals and quantum implications, uh, that doesn't really necessarily allow us to make the step to entangle systems and definitely not to give a causal explanation for that. But I'm very interested to hear also what other people today will have to say about that and about quantum causal models, because I think that might get us a step closer. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. I have already one question. Hi, so, so this is a question not about the quantum part, but about the part earlier around slide 20 that you had. Um, uh, and yeah, really, really, the question I'm trying to get at here is, um, I, I'm trying to think about the way that, that, that your probabilistic model of the counterfactual here relates to uh, the, So you talked about having a possible world's model and then having subjective probabilities on each possible world. But I, I'm thinking when, when when I'm explaining counterfactuals to people, I usually, I say, you know, for example, we'll describe the type of a patient as helped or hurt or always recover or never recover. And I'm very clear that although we use these words, help, hurt, always, uh, et cetera, that sort of suggests some modal operation, that uh, that, that doesn't exist, essentially, that we have a, a population of, of subjects and then uh, some of them, you know, uh, may may be assigned treatment by some natural process, or some of them, uh, or but we could also give all of them treatment. But the basic point is there is no dynamic change. There's, there, there's just you know the set of units exist and they get treatment. It could be by an external process or it could be an endogenous process, and then there's an outcome. And there isn't a sort of change from one one. The world doesn't change from one to another, and it, in a certain sense. I, what I'm trying to say is it seems as if in a statistical causal model, you have a population of, po of possible worlds that then evolve forwards rather than just having a single one. So, so I guess my question is, can you do, yeah, can you extend what you're describing here? So we're not talking about just one system, but populations of systems with distributions over them. So well, that's, that's, yeah, that, no, that's a very interesting question. I mean, um, so when I later on presented also the causal interventionist modalities and the account that Halperin has, then what I've hinted at here is just the, the most basic uh, modalities. But of course, even Halperin in his book, he has uh, much more complicated uh, models in the background where you would have an ordering over possible worlds depending on the type of interventions that you do and you, you have a ranking of the, over them. And using that ranking, then you can make much more fine-grained um, uh, uh, statements. So for him, in that case, it would allow you to say, well, causality is not a zero-one thing, but it should be graded. And that relates back to this probabilistic account. So I think the models can be made much more complicated in the background, having rankings and orderings over them. But I didn't. Yeah, so I didn't present that here, but I think that is possible. So that should not be too complicated. Of course, I mean, the more features that you add to it, <laughs> the more complicated the setting will become. But I mean, in the literature, I think there are examples of where um, 
Kalperin, for instance, has worked with these rankings over plotting the worlds um, in the underlying models. So, so I think that should be it should be possible to generalize there. But that indeed, I mean, the most basic setting that I've presented here that is not present. I have a really, really, really basic question. Um, when you introduced the, the, the dynamics, you, you use the term over and over again for the, you have after the antecedent blah, right? And one assumes that dynamics has to do with changes in time and so on. But then you said you can recover the material conditional, but the material conditional has no temporal connotations at all. Yeah. So, so I, I take it, do, do you mean you can recover the material conditional with an additional temporal restriction on it? Well, these models themselves don't have any, I don't know where is my material conditional, I think it's... Uh, it's a simple, sorry. does after mean literally temporally yeah. after when you say after? Because that's the way it reads. Yeah, indeed it does. I mean, so in the way that dynamic epistemic logic and the dynamic conditionals look at it, it, it does mean you either go to a next state where phi is true, or you go to a new model where you have intervened on phi. And the, the afterwards, I mean, the, the temporal reading, so the temporal modalities are not included in this, but it really means a succession of models. You go from one model to another, a succession of states. Now for the material implication it is crucial that the state is the same as we're finds true. So the action itself, so the, the alpha action for the material implication is one in which the state does not change. You only check if phi is true and you stay at the same state and phi has to be true at that same state. So that is indeed the only one where there is no temporal evolution of any type. So I'm staying, so the, the, the relation there is a loop relation that gets me back to the same state S. So S has to be true at state, uh, phi has to be true at state S, and I'm checking in that same state if psi is true. And if that is the case, then the material conditional holds. So you're right, there is no temporal change in that case, but in most of the other ones there is. But the, the one in which there is no temporal change change would be a special case of the other of the whole set of all kinds of other actions that you can um, that you can model so there is also a, a question online but uh, maybe Michael Weissman can ask it directly on zoom I can also ask uh, sure um, I can unmute myself um, an actual quantum measurement, doesn't really, in general, lead to a sharply defined subspace, but uh, the outcome is typically consistent with a, a bigger set of subspaces, but more consistent with some than the other than others. In other words, it's it's probabilistic. You get a density matrix out. Um, is the generalization to that not sharply defined um, measurement output uh, pretty straightforward? Um, or do we go back to the previous talk about uh, adding, adding logarithms of uh, prior density matrices and uh, res well, result matrices? Well, look, as a logician, um, I think that these density matrices, they, they're used to capture mixed states, right? So my talk here today was only about pure states. Now, if you look at what the meaning is of these mixed states, then actually there is some kind of epistemic uncertainty over the set of pure states because don't know which. So we work with a larger collection because there is a notion of uncertainty ingrained in what this mixed state is. Now, of course, in quantum physics, it's very use useful. We can work directly with the density operators in a logical setting it would be much more straightforward to actually make that uncertainty fully explicit. So epistemic logic is a logic to reason and to model uncertainty. And instead of just plugging in everywhere where I use a pure state, a mixed state, um, my idea would be to actually go and 
make the epistemic uncertainty explicit and capture it in a, yeah, in, in a sophisticated way. This we did not do. We've worked with density operators as well, uh, but I mean, most of the work that we've done and, and the most part where the logic is very well behaved is on pure states. So, but I think it, it requires uh, right. a nice setting to really look further into the density Thanks. Okay, so I also have a question. So I propose that you stay online, but uh, we are already over time. So maybe we can stop there uh, and uh, we start again, I guess, at 20 to 11. Thanks a lot. Thank you.